or a fat stack or a fat. Oh, all right. We are live. We are suffering from technical difficulties. So if you're watching, my apologies if something weird happens. Is something weird happening? Aside from our silence? I'm worried it's... <laughs> Are we taking over the show from Conrad? Is that what's happening? No, we don't want to take over the show from Conrad. Well, you don't want to. Maybe that was been my agenda all along. You son of a... I swear to you. Okay. So we so, are hey. here with Conrad from Wednesday Night Reviews. I'm Jason Lapidus. Hey, I'm Chris Sanigan. And we're of Group of Seven Comics. And we make comic books. And we like Conrad. And it is a Wednesday. And it is a Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. So we are going to do some reviews. Uh, hopefully Conrad works out his technical glitches. And I... we're able to uh, connect with y'all out there about comics. Absolutely. Hey, you know what? As we as we work through this, everybody, um, I can share. Uh, it is Wednesday, being the day of the comic release, as it's known. And I did go to my local, the Dragon, here in Guelph, Ontario, and picked up a couple of... A uh, couple of... Oh. <laughs> now he's dis disappeared. Uh, picked up a couple of uh, comics. Jason would love your thought on it. So, hey, I got three things. I got uh, issue seven of uh, Transformers, uh, written by Daniel Warren Johnson. Uh, but new art, new artist on this one. That's a new oh, art. Oh, uh, really? Jorge Cortona, maybe? Am I okay. getting that last name incorrect? But Spicer, Mike Spicer, still on colors. Okay. And cover by Daniel Warren Johnson. Okay. Uh, but I am a fan of Daniel Orange and Johnson's writing as well as I'm a fan of his art. So excited to to go into that. I love the first arc. Also picked up issue two of the Peach Momoko Ultimate X-Men. Right. Um, so that's, you know, speaking of X-Men and our connecting back to our show previously in X-Men, which you can check on another group's YouTube channel. Uh, so that's exciting. I really enjoyed the first issue and I love her and her art and her approach. And again, someone who... Uh, does it all herself in terms of, of as a cartoonist writing and, and, and illustrating um, in that in that space. So that was really cool. And then lastly, I picked up Darth Vader number forty five, drawn by our good buddy Adam Gorham, who's such a nice nice person and an excellent artist. And uh, yeah, been enjoying that Darth Vader series too. I mean, it's pretty cool to see Vader unleashed. And uh, certainly, I've had chats with Adam about just even drawing that, and that's uh, that's a pretty fun thing. So that was my trip the local comic book store today very nice i went yesterday oh. okay what because but i that's tuesday and the, the comics come out on the wednesday i know but i was free yesterday and oh, i okay. have my own show called tuesday afternoon reviews i thought you were gonna say or... naps tuesday afternoon <laughs> naps so i went yesterday and picked up a stash that had been there for a couple of weeks and sometimes tuesday i you know i'm so i look at it like i'm not too early by a day i'm a, a few days late like six days late gotcha. so i have things from last week including well Give whatever i got minor threats which one is that again it's issue this is issue one of the newest arc called the fastest way down so i think this is like the title kind of explains to this is Patton oswald's comic Patton oswald's comic that's it yeah and jordan bloom um okay. It is like imagine there are like some minor villains that are in the story. So it's minor threats. It's kind minor of happily threat. named. Cool. I've got uh, three issues of the Immortal Thor here to oh. read. Who's doing that one? Uh, Al Ewing. Oh yeah, cool. Nice. And I am behind on reading this. I'm a fan of, uh, in this case, Tom King and Elsa Chartier. They sure. do a book called Love Everlasting, so I picked up that. Um, Daredevil. Gotta have our DD. I don't even know who's on this at the moment. I'm not paying attention. I haven't read it in a long time. I have a pile of comics I need to read. I'm one of those guys that just has a pull list and there's books piling up and I'm not actively right. reading. Um, I'm kind of like hoping that I break my legs so that I can sit and read comics for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. Issue 6 of Transform. Noted. I'm going to go full misery on you. Yeah. Oh, another Love Everlasting. Cool. And then issue 30 of Firepower. Is it the last one? 
Oh, oh cool. maybe. Might... I don't know. It's like got a spine on it. Uh, I... Thirty firepower. I'm up to about issue twenty in reading. Uh, another DD with Doctor Strange. Very nice. Then Batman Dark Age, which I'm getting are bought because of the Mike Allred art. Oh, very so, cool. Like, Mike Allred on Batman, like yeah, man. Yeah. So I, I that's what I picked up yesterday. And uh, when I go to pick up what came out today, I will be getting that. Maybe I'll get the Transformers. I got to read these and see if I'm into it still. Yeah, and fair enough. We'll go from there. And and uh, uh, a few other comics. I don't even know what it is. We'll, we'll see. We'll see when I get there. Who knows? Yeah, the the good folks at Planet X often put books aside for me, saying like, "Hey, we're just going to take some of your money, and uh, we're not going to. You didn't ask for these, but we're giving them to you anyway. And uh, we'll see what's there when I get there. Conrad, have you worked out? The gremlins in your system. I hope so. We're gonna find out, but so far this is the smoothest this has been. So I'm gonna say I have, uh, and I'm gonna hope. Um, that being said, uh, Chris, Jason, thank you so much for joining me. This is our three year reunion. Um, the last time we did this, I believe, was three years ago. What? That's that's wild. Yeah. Maybe maybe more so because we see you like often during yeah. the year when we get to hang out in person and see each other often. But yeah. Yeah, it's been three years. So um basically for, for the show tonight, um I wanted to, to sort of recap where where we were when we first did our, our interview, our first one. What the hell has gone on since? Uh and and how you've ended up at uh international comics festivals representing canada uh as like top of your crowd um no 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 i have to stop <laughs> you there and i saw this in your post and i was like i don't want to trash us in some post but top of our craft as individuals we are doing the best that we've done the things we're doing within the measure of ourselves Fair. But representing Canada as the top of the craft, it's not that at all. It, it it wasn't that kind of thing. We weren't representing because of a meritocracy. We were representing because we worked within a system. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank thank you for qualifying that. But I just it's important. Top <laughs> of the craft. Yes. <laughs> There it is. That's the confidence I want to see. Uh, I, I'm confident within reality. Um, okay. I love what we do. I'm really proud of where we've come from. Um, but I'm I'm realistic. I'm realistic, and I and I know that we've you know we've been making comics together since 2017. Yeah. Actually, yesterday was the anniversary of the first time we posted pages online in 2017. So it's been oh, wow. seven years of us posting yeah. artwork, comics, I should say, out into uh, the public. Uh, and we've come a long way, baby, you know, in, in, in seven years. But if you look at it as if we had started when we were 25, we're st we still have room to get better. Lots of room to get better. So oh, of course. Um, we didn't get to international comic book festivals because we... Like, there was the, the entire field of cartoonists and comic makers, and, like, they selected us out of the field. There was another process, which we're so happy to talk about, that enabled sure. us to uh, make use of the opportunity that was presented. So, yeah. Nice. Okay. Lots I of mean, respect I, to I, our contemporaries. So much respect to our contemporaries. 100%. Yeah. The the humbleness, the, uh, the drive, the passion. Um... I guess to, to start with, to sort of to recap, the last time we spoke uh, online in this format, uh, you guys had just finished the first run of your series. Your book was being published. The, the first book was being collected into a graphic novel. Um, and that's sort of where you were at. Yes, that one, right? There. Actually, is that the first print or is that the reissuing? This is the first print. Um, okay. And... I'm I'm semantical, so there. This is the first and only print. Okay. The, I mean, you can see, for argument's sake, this is not a second printing of the same book. It's a Correct. it's a different book. Um, the story content is the same story, but the book itself is a different book with additional content. 
and presented in a different way. So they have different ISBNs, and uh, this one is out of print forever. So if you are a collector and you've got this, wow, what a treat. And if you can find this anywhere, yeah, snack, snatch that up because it's it's gone. And this is the version that will endure for all time. Mm. I, I don't know. Being silly. But yeah, so in three years ago, this was uh, just out, I believe. Yeah, it was um, July. It was summer of 2020, which is the was the best time in the world to release anything. I don't know if you remember that, mm. but we we really wanted to capitalize on momentum in in the summer of 2020 about releasing anything, and so we did. Um, yeah, so it's been yeah about three and a bit years. Yeah, right on. And I guess just to start with, since that time, since you guys were focusing on making group of seven comics um getting the graphic novel being able to sell it at cons distribute it get your work known um to where you are now you guys have currently you're you're doing a lot uh, so from group of seven comics as a, a direct sequel to came peregrines uh which it looks like uh, jason you're going to throw up a copy of peregrines perhaps let's let's continue i'll get there I, okay I think, cool uh, the first issue sure Right Perfect. There. So you've got that book out. Uh, also coming out of Group of Seven Comics, you guys started doing a, and related to Peregrines, um, uh, basically a Instagram-based panel per day post, which is then collected into that book. Um, you also have now done a Londinium Paradise. Love that cover. Yes! I love how it just keeps going. He's like, oh, yeah, we're not the best of our field. Or, you know, we just, you know, we got this one book we do. And I'm trying to do the props as you out. talk. I love it. Uh, you, you also do a podcast, or not a podcast, a show. I guess it's a podcast. I don't even what to call this thing. But you guys do a show together where you are going through basically from the beginning, is it? Or did you start at a specific issue? You were talking about previously in X-Men. Where which are our ongoing YouTube series every Tuesday night for the last couple of years, where we go through chronologically X Men comics, starting with giant size X Men. So the introduction of uh, the second team, really the first team being that Cyclops, Marvel Girl, Iceman, Beast, Angel, Angel. That's your that's your cue, Jason. Angel. Yeah, that's your cue. <laughs> And uh, but the, the you know the 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 team the next the next team the Wolverine the Storm Colossus Nightcrawler um, team. So we have been reading chronologically since the introduction of that team, 1977. Jason, I think 75. The, 75. There you are. And uh, you know we we've we've maybe passed over a couple of issues here and there. We've brought in other series. We haven't passed over any. I mean, maybe maybe go into more in depth. Maybe I'm thinking we go in more depth about certain issues because we like them a little more. Um, we brought another series related. This is now this is really you know the Chris Claremont writing, and you know it started with John with Dave Cockrum on, on pencils, John Byrne back Look to Cockrum, then Paul Smith. I love now, it. Now we're in the the John Romita Jr. and uh, era with uh, and it, hey even Barry Windsor Smith. He threw an issue in there as well. Um, all to say, it's been this heck of a joy ride um, going through these comics that we say, you know, really, you know, became classics and have informed, you know, this corner of comicdom, the X verse in all media types going, you know, all, you know, whether it's the animated series in the 90s, the movies, um, and then now back to the animated series uh, that was released this year as a follow up. And, you know, the stories, so many of the stories from that run have endured. Um, and we're really on this journey. And it's a really, it started in, again, you know, jokingly, you know, releasing comics during the pandemic. But then it started as an opportunity for Jay and I to just connect every week and have some fun. I had never gone through these comics. Uh, mm -hmm. My my ex knowledge was, uh, was limited. Uh, but it's been a pure joyride seeing the evolution of these characters and these stories every week basically we've only missed a few um and then and then it's grown we get people coming in the chat we get special guests we've had current x writers and artists from our our gta comics community 
and it's global. We had someone on the stream yesterday talk about we were talking hockey because of course we'll throw in hockey as well. And and someone started started taking shots from Philadelphia. It was wonderful. <laughs> so all to say, uh, yeah, that's something else that we can we have on the go as part of Group Seven Comics. I love I, it. Me too. Me too. I love it a lot. I really love that. Uh, you know, the as these things become billion dollar franchises, you know, and you watch Disney buy Fox, you know, and and these characters pop into the MCU bit by bit. Professor X shows up in Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness. Beast shows up in the Marvels and the bonus extra scene spoilers if you haven't seen that one yet. It's on Disney Plus streaming right now. Um, so as these things pop in, you know, it it's funny to think like it's such a huge franchise, really, and a huge commodity. And then if you just trace it back, it's they're, they're like these ridiculous comics that came out every month from a team of creators that were kind of making it up as they were going, that got in the rhythm of it. And it was never really this incredibly strategically planned mega opus it was like we have a deadline we're gonna make a page a day we get this book out by the end of the month uh you know claremont would throw a thread into each issue that he hopes will kind of continue to go uh for months and months and maybe he'll pick up again maybe he won't you know we're at the part right now in reading x-men where he's got like gene gray has been dead for about 50 issues uh which means 50 months and there's Madeline Pryor as a character. You can tell he has no idea what he's going to do with her. He just wanted there to be a Jean Grey analog in the series. Someone for Scott, you know, is is she going to be the reincarnation? Whatever. He doesn't know yet. And then there's like Rachel, this character from the future who has Phoenix powers too. And so he's got these kind of, he's trying things out to see what's going to work. And as readers... I have a sense where all this is going because I did read X-Men actively uh, as a 10 and 11, 12 year old, you know, so I know where it's going. Um, and I know how his run ends after 15 years. And I'm just fascinated by this like weekly inspection of this really grand narrative that was kind of made up spontaneously. And it's the other thing I love about it is it's one of the only things that happens in Marvel that is not really at its core a Stan Lee with Kirby or with Steve Ditko concept. Y okay, yes. Oh, okay. Lee and Kirby make up the X-Men in 1963. Yes. And it doesn't succeed. You know, Kirby's off the book pretty quick. Lee stops writing it pretty quick. And like the thing flounders. But in 1975, it gets rejuvenated with all new characters and... Uh -huh. They tweak the premise a tiny bit. I think, oh, I'm getting a visitor. <laughs> Sorry, a small furry visitor is coming in. Hey, buddy. Um, and they tweak that premise. And what we get for 15 years is like Claremont's X-Men. And I can't think of any other Marvel franchise which doesn't have its best run being Lee and, you know, someone. Lee and Kirby, Lee and Ditko. Like this, the, the best X-Men run of all time isn't the original run and it's kind of crazy that there's this thing that mm -hmm. goes on to become this billion dollar franchise or multi-billion dollar franchise that doesn't really stem from uh the those classic stories the ones that are classic are actually the claremont ones so it's kind of kind of fun that it's almost like a new bronze age marvel piece as opposed to it being a silver age marvel piece i'm i'm interested in all the those little things I find it fascinating. The other thing that's just, I mean, interesting just to, to build on that, Jay, about the run and the timing. The I mean, starting it when we when it started for us, you know, it was an opportunity again just to hang out and talk comics, right? But what we've seen recently, like it, it there are, and because it's fresh to us, um, because we're re reading these things and we we voice act, right? You know, voice, you know, so spoiler alert, you'll get some pretty bad voice acting coming from us. Um, or pretty great, or pretty great taste. depending on your on your on your take. Pretty However, uh, we're we are um, thank you. We are um, 
Okay, so you mentioned the MCU, the MCU, okay? You know, big films, blah, blah, blah. So extra scene in the Marvels, and it's Beast and Binary. Like that version, and we read that comic with that outfit, like, I don't know, four months ago. And so that that showed up on screen. I was like, oh, I know exactly who this character is. I know, I'm like, I didn't know any of that before. So that was kind of cool. And then in the episode four of the new X-Men 97 series, they do the life death storyline between Storm and Forge. And that's, we read that comic and it's Barry Windsor Smith. We read that comic in January. And so like that is fresh. So like they are, there's this really weird, really weird parallel between, and maybe it demonstrates the longevity and impact of those stories more than anything is like, we're going through these and there's like a timeline (laughs) and then suddenly these things are popping up in other media x media which is yeah we, for, like we get to we get to even kind of like geek out even harder about it because it's so fresh in our minds or we hey everybody remember that episode we did two weeks ago well guess what that character just showed up on x whatever <laughs> you know so that's that's been this this week so obviously it's tapped into something and that's hey l- listen we're, we're we're at 299 subscribers it's not like we've got thousands upon thousands but it's connecting and that run of stories is we we have a, a regular group, right? I know I know you've you've popped in a couple of times, and we have a, a Tuesday oh, yeah. night regular crew who chooses to either put us on in the background or whatever it is, or or actively engage with us every Tuesday to talk X Men, which is pretty cool. Yeah, seeing you know when the the new series popped up on Disney Plus, and like by issue two or episode two, they're like doing this storyline, and Literally. it's in my pile. Of like stuff yeah. that we're about to have on the show, it's like my pile's right here. Uh, I couldn't, I just can't believe it. You know that that um, the timing of everything is really neat. Like exactly what you're saying, Chris. That these these stories are either you know front of mind with pop culture or just under the surface and ready to come out at any time. And mm-hmm. X Men has just been this um, really popular brand since since 1992, since that animated series. Which, you know, at the time I was a little too old for, but still was nostalgic for Saturday morning cartoons. So I watched it even as a teenager. And um, I love meeting all these other like toy collectors and comic collectors who are just diehard X-Men people. And this show means the world to them. And I'm yeah, I'm all in for that. I love seeing people being passionate about um, about comics and so I'm getting a chance to share these stories in a unique way with a new audience, uh, some friends, some strangers that have become friends. It's it's a real joy. And then the, also just from the critical point of view, to look at how Marvel in the 80s, you know, like that brand, which I'm so fond of overall, crafts team adventure storytelling. I mean, mm-hmm. I like the interplay of characters, like learning about the, the mix of, um, because, you know, Chris, you and I are, I don't know if you knew this, we make a team comic book. And, yeah, surprise, buddy. <laughs> I know if you, so I, I love seeing, like, a version of team adventurers in some form. Um, and then seeing, like, hey, what are some of the pitfalls of those kinds of stories? And what are some of the, the graces that those stories have? And uh, learning from it, both visually and, and through uh, narrative. Yeah, I find it fascinating. So that's actually something I wanted to ask about. So given what you said earlier about the X series uh, being fairly apparent where the the writers didn't know what they were doing, or rather they didn't have a structure for what was coming next. um, When it comes to Chris writing the the comics that you've written, as well as the stuff you guys have put out on Instagram and all the the different content for Peregrines you've created... um, when you're reading these now fabled legendary stories, which going through them, you're like, oh, these guys were kind of just cobbling this as they went. How has that informed how you how you are currently writing compared to how you were writing when I first interviewed you uh, three years ago? I think the big thing about um, maybe in terms of thinking about like how maybe the writing process has changed or at least intentionally some of the things that you know I've tried to do purposefully around that is is be which is maybe flies in the face of uh, a little bit of of Chris Claremont is be economical with my language. Mm. <laughs> so, 
So, uh, no, I just mean like, you know, I think when it comes to uh, mapping out things, you know, Group of Seven Comics 1 to 6 was, was written over six to eight months, the first draft of like the full arc. And we cut it, at, you uh-huh. know, it was, it was always going to be six issues. And, you know, because we thought that was a thing to do. <laughs> and and that's how that's how it laid out. Uh, yeah. With uh, with since then, I mean, Peregrines, we, 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 re- we realized both from a production perspective and a storytelling perspective that we can actually still produce an impactful arc uh maybe we can cut it down to four issues and what that does is it just means that we can be a little more like six is a large undertaking and i think we were you know we were naive not naive well i mean we were just new to it so we wanted to go in and try it and do it all and then after that writing for that particular story has been okay well what else can we do but in a like a like again be more economic about it what can we do to make our choices that much more efficient because you know like just from a you know because we, we want to produce more comics we want to do it better jason alluded to us you know we're constantly learning about this um now that's 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 like the peregrine story arc the peregrines one shots that we do like on instagram and then produce as you know its own separate kind of solo adventures those are what i mean they've gotten more and more um planned or at least structured as we've moved along uh in terms of like layout like what's the next few days Mm -hmm. but but it starts off like it's like it's monday it's like what's happening i'm like um uh, they they jump from the roof oh yeah it's tuesday what's happening they land on the ground (laughs) (laughs) you know uh so it's i think we love to play with all different kinds of process when it comes to our books um and so i think we definitely like i know i've definitely been informed like going through the like the x series for example um i see things and i and, and i love the stories uh, but i see things that like you know give me pause for thought about how to write moving forward for sure um yeah yeah so it's but it's but again like we have just you know you're saying we, we do have a lot of different kind of products on the go and so we can try out different things like really this is the universe that we created for us and we're really we're really pleased that it's found that audience um but we 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 want to still play right we still really want to play around that's what really drives us and gets us excited and and so uh you know going through some of these um exercises really of, of i mean i mean as much as our show is a ton of fun it really is an exercise in, in craft and production mm-hmm. and art and all of it um so it's been it's been nice to kind of do it that way instead of you know maybe taking a class i love it and, and sort of to, to feed off that for you jason one of the things that has come up either we're just talking or in our last interview something that sort of predominantly came out of our concept was the economy of line um, and your artwork, your art style is very um, minimalist, uh, expressive in, in the way that you like. You're not like hyper detailed like Jim Lee would be in the '90s, where there's lines on everything and buckles and belts and and you know creases everywhere. You're getting right to the point to show the action in the scene. When you're going through all of these old X comics and all of the stuff that you've taken on in the last three years. How is that informing the way that you're thinking about art or rather, how has it changed the way you're thinking about art and the process? It's helped me see um, the folly of the two extremes. So if I, you know, if you look at it from let's, I, I jokingly called this once to on a live stream somewhere else, the quietly uh, Ramita junior continuum where one artist will work <laughs> as long as he wants wow. until he's perfected it and he gets paid accordingly, you know, versus one who gets it done by the end of the day, whether it's good or not. And there, there are graces to both and there might be some problems in both, depending on the story you're trying to tell. And um, I, just to talk like jokingly for a minute, when you go for super detail and and take all the time in the world it better be damn perfect since i know i cannot do perfect drawing 
I'm going to move towards a style that allows me to have like the ability to bob and weave and say, yeah, but I did it fast. So <laughs> because I don't want to get caught with taking the punch in the face where it's like, it's not perfect because my instinct is I want it, of course, everything to be perfect. So I love those artists that are able to capture motion and energy and communicate, which is the bottom line of all of this is you are trying to tell a story. So I love those artists that are able to do that either in tandem with a, a great writer or on their own as, as cartoonists um, that are able to do that with economy of line and at a pretty good pace. And I really struggle with trying to do things fast, really, really struggle. And um, those Instagram comics have enabled that or at least have up until, you know, this, this past winter really enabled that fast process. Um, and then it's, you know, sort of get a little bogged down with maybe too long a process and other things, um, in the last one over the winter, uh, with Badlands. Um, but it's, I also really, I find myself staring at art by pencilers and inkers where they are deceptively simple, where they spent more time planning than they did rendering. Mm. So I look at all the work that Jim Lee and Scott Williams put in. I love to look at their work, but I really think I'm still just looking at the basic shapes. I'm not really appreciating every line. So if you're doing a guitar solo and you're finger tapping at the speed of light, like I'm not even hearing every note, dude, I'm just getting that big wash, that big impression. Yeah. So what's the value of every, of every note? Maybe it's to show off your virtuosity, which I don't have. Or to, you know, um, it's, it, I don't necessarily think more adds value. So I'm trying to figure out like a guitar player, like George Harrison, for instance, which plays, he plays more minimal, but man, those lines, those guitar licks are economic and gorgeous. And I'm trying to plan more. So, so guys like Toth, uh, you know, Mignola, um, Darwin Cook. They, they plan a little more and their style doesn't look overly rendered. So I think it's sort of like, where do you, where do you spend your time when you're planning a page or when you're drawing a page, do you spend it rendering or do you spend it planning? And where do you slide, uh, you know, your, your marker along that dial? And I mm -hmm. think, you know, maybe let's just say for fun, let's put it somewhere like 70% planning, 30% rendering. And that way you control how the page reads you are a little bit more shape oriented, making more use of contrast um, flow as opposed to every single crease, every single wrinkle, every single hair, I, and then not planning enough so that things are challenging to read. And the way that you can tell if something's good to read is um, if you could film your eye as you read a comic, you know, you oh, have yeah. a camera there and you film where does the eye go? And if it accurately follows the direction that the person wanted you to follow, that means they guided you really, really well. Um, Dave Mazzucchelli, like, oh, right. Oh, his, his wow. work, like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That, that kind of stuff really speaks to me. And uh, a lot of us, when we open up a two page spread, our eyes dart to the, the bottom right corner and then back and look, look all around. And then we try and break it down. We're consciously making an effort to read it as opposed to, the way the page is laid out, um, directing us to read it the way it was intended. So I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying. There's also, I'd, I'd, I'd suggest too that, you know, we're seven years into this in terms of public release of content, let's just, put it that way. And, you know, we're up to book, I don't know, 14 or something like that, whatever it is, uh, which is, you know, I mean, when you say it out loud, that's, that's a, that's a nice bit of body of work for seven years. Um, but, you know, I mean, I know I've mentioned <laughs> economics. You've mentioned economics, Jason. That's clearly the main theme of Group of Seven is all about economy. Um, but uh, the other thing that's, that's that's very true is that, you know, we're not discovering these characters for the first time anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's a familiarity, familiarity, familiarity with both the art of the characters. Like I've seen, Jason, you whip off a Peregrine, you whip off a... Uh, oh God, John yeah. McCurry, a con Smythe at a con like that, right? 
because it's, you know, you've practiced, you've done it so much and you've landed the, you know, the dimensions, you know, of, of the economy to deliver that. I know that when I write, yeah, there's room for characters to grow and we want to expand universes and add more characters. But I'm also, I've also, that's, that's built upon a foundation. I know some of the dynamics already between some of the team, the members, of the peregrines, like we've already established this. So yeah, we can, we can go, we can go back to that. So we're, we really aren't on ground zero for a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, so we can start a story. We can start a story on a Monday, let's just say, and yeah, maybe, you know, it's loose and we're working through it, but like by that Friday and say we released a bunch of panels, like, you know, those relationships have come through once again, you know, like those, like we know, we know in Peregrine's land, like, you know, gr you know, the relationship between Gray the leader and Dottie the rookie is like, that's that, that's that mentor mentee thing, right? We know Cece's always going to be up for a fight, like without, you know, she's got the bit of that Wolverine kind of nature to her. We know Bess is going to be like calculated and like deliver what needs to get delivered, right? Like, so we yeah. know these things and then we get to play them with each other, right? So that is a, uh, that's a lovely thing that has happened over seven years of, or, you know, even longer co-creation um, and, and release of these characters in the storytelling. Right. And just to take exactly what you're saying and, and talk visually, um, I think we all know in our mind's eye how, what animated Batman looks like in 3D. When you create a character from scratch, there isn't that framework. And it took me a couple of years to figure out, okay, I actually, I'm now at that point where I know, I know exactly what the paragraphs look like from every angle. I know the way their jackets move. I've, I've, I know how much flex there is in certain parts. I know the sound of their jackets when they move. I know the sound of their it's so weird the sound of their pants. Um, <laughs> just it, 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 you spend so much time with that that you actually have to work out those things. And one of the things that um, you can kind of ask someone when they're drawing is like, do you know how that car is built? And they're like, I'm just drawing from photo reference. Like, but do you know how? those mm. wheels and gravity and the the g-force is putting pressure on the axle like do you know how that's gonna warp as the car is driving if the person doesn't really know it shows up in their drawing that they don't yeah. understand the physics physics of that vehicle and so you have to go through a ton of pre-drawing before you can understand and communicate what you understand to the reader and i'm like I'm kind of there now with at least the peregrines themselves, uh, their equipment, the environment, the locations. I'm like, oh, no, I'm on the fly. I'm making it up. I'm trying to be loose about it and not get bogged down and trying to hide through, you know, use of black and gray, like hide what I don't know. But at least with the characters and the way they move, I feel like I'm, I'm there. Like I'm ready to, um, they're, they're bursting from my imagination visually now mm -hmm. whenever i put pen to paper um you know the first time that i drew any peregrines might have been on my birthday in 2020 chris i think you i was uh i was staying at my in-laws for um a, i think a jewish holiday uh, we were there for some celebration and we're kind of hunkered down for a few days and uh you had i think you sent me the idea or like we started talking about it over online maybe a phone call and i probably got to drawing of the first picture ever like right away like instantly once we talked about you know th this concept of these nurses that are on the front lines of world war one and they are um you know skydiving out of a zeppelin a stolen zeppelin and they go on these adventures or you know around the around the ins and outs of the first world war i went right away and started drawing them like what i drew that day was not what i would draw today because i went through iteration after iteration until i found those lines and those those yeah. like the cuts of fabric that i thought would accent both would serve historically and serve motion and animation mm -hmm. uh, until you know that mask worked and the amount of people that come up and and like dig their outfit it's it's such a it's it's such, it's, it's one of the compliments that, that sits with me that i'm really happy about is that someone likes the way they look because that's coming from you know your initial spark
Chris and, and the historical references that, that we found and um, mm -hmm. looked at and then play with it, like mix it with the other things that we love. And when those characters sing, when the drawing works right and they look like they're ready to go, oh, man, it, I, I love looking at them. And if <laughs> you told me I could spend the rest of my life drawing peregrines, I would be more than happy to uh, to yeah. wrestle with that reality. Like, it, they are so much, they're really fun for me to draw. And I think about them every day. That mask, it's just the, uh, the collar. And, oh, there's there's so much... Um you know, when I think just, I'm now, I have like images in my head of like some of those first drawings, I have them on my phone and, um, you know, just to see the evolution of the art and the design concept. Um, like, you know, like I know we, we often will throw in bonus material to our, our books after we publish, you know, just to show whether we're in progress or whatever, but maybe we'll have to, maybe when, when we, when we uh, put together the Peregrine's trade, um, we'll do that. But there's, there's some excellent ones where it's like, I'll just say it's like more feathery. Like it's like oh yeah yeah, yeah like, more like bird like more birdy <laughs> more bird like um it's and it, you know I I have the the photos of like I was in a museum in Liverpool visiting with family you know this is always about family I swear right? we're always at family doing this but uh, that's good though I was I was looking at uh, their their Egyptian exhibit and I got a whole bunch of ideas about story and then you know fast forward a couple years later in, in issue eight that's exactly what's happening. You know, nice. and 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 so it, it's just, yeah, it's great to see those initial sparks, you know, move into something and like actually as a as to go from a uh, using like with Group of Seven comics and Most Secret Tale going from like very historical fiction, like literally people who existed and then putting them in extraordinary circumstances to a yeah. uh, completely, completely like brand new IP, right? Like completely created oh, yeah. our IP peregrines like there is nothing out there like that it is ours they are fictional characters all of them um that and to see the response has been uh has been really 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 validating i think um and it, and it just keeps going like we were talking we're always talking jane are always talking about <laughs> ideas and you know good you know, it's, good it, it, so we were talking about like yeah like the next the next thing that's like there's something percolating that's probably going to come. Yeah, yeah no spoilers. No spoilers. No, but like that's the next thing. You know what I mean? We're already teasing it. We're already trying to figure it out. They're like, we're talking about two next things. Yeah. One oh. is there and oh. one is there. I like and it. we're, yeah, it is so much fun to um, understand the universe that the characters are existing in yeah. better. And then the possibilities, right? Like where it can go, and and uh, you know, seeing you excited is one of my favorite things in the world. Is talking these things out with you, and you know, whatever it might be, it is it is such a joy. I was just looking through, um, like, okay, can I flash a panel up and see if this? Yeah, works? please. So oh there's this one here, okay, and it's a character surprised. Like I never would have drawn a mask. Where, like the eyes open like the wide. eyes are right but you just, i tried it it was like a two second drawing and it communicated what i needed to communicate do those masks really open no they the the roundness of the eye does not actually break the borders of their goggle but it read properly and uh like having the opportunity to play with them enough without any editor or um uh, brand manager being like that's not on the model of the peregrine that we are making the action figure of and that's in our video game right now uh, but being able to just experiment i'm not hinting at anything there <laughs> yeah, those, no you just released the projects it's things and video games <laughs> do not say anything about lucasfilm and how they force people to redraw darth vader because of you know problems don't don't talk about that it's but can you imagine how challenging that is when you have mm. to go through now that being said being getting to play with those toys must be incredible but creatively uh having to like getting to play with with a collaborator with no oversight is like a really pure way to to be able to make it is so much so much fun so i'm i really dig that but that was a uh, in one of those monthly comics this one was from peregrine's hunter's moon um which we made 
January, I think, of 2023. I think so. Um, yeah, that, that it was right. such yeah. a joy to make this one to tell a tale of our favorite foursome, uh, actually on Canadian soil, having our, our first <laughs> adventure in Canada it, with you know with all the comics we had made up to that. Point. Um, yeah. yeah, so much fun to do. So I'm I'm loving that stuff, man. Yeah, it's it too much fun. For so, such a, a group that's been in, like for just to, to like to be connected to you know uh, Canadian things, uh, you know whether it's inspiration or history or whatever art pop culture, the fact that it took us like book thirteen to actually put a story in Canada is kind of funny. I mean, you did base it in World War One, which you know, I don't know is over yeah. the pond, so you're you're, you're fine. Um, <laughs> what I, I want to get to the the how people can get the books, but I have one question before then. Um, my favorite prose writer, um, R.A. Salvatore, who's written, I want to say, arguably one of the longest series uh, within the Forgotten Realms ever. It's like 37 books or something. It's crazy. Um, he's written with his characters for so long that basically he says, like, he'll sit down at his, his computer and he'll start typing the next chunk of story and he might laugh and giggle because he's not writing it. The characters are talking to him and telling him, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what happened next. Oh, this happened. Um, I wanted to get your both of your perspectives on that. Because you've worked on these characters now for so long, you know the world that you've created. Chris, when you're writing these, and again, you've gone from the archivist to historical fiction. Now you're just pure fiction set in history. How does that work for you when you're you're conceptually writing them thinking about the story do they tell you what's going on are they chess pieces in your grand game uh, what comes to mind for you and then afterward jason because you know what these people look like from every angle what their clothes sound like how they move the stretch the flex the the way they can physically move their body posture um when you're drawing them do you have to think currently this is how this person would be positioned and then be sitting, or is it just naturally coming? You going first, Chris? Sure. Yeah. Chris. yeah. yeah. Um, the character's talking to me. That's lunacy. Uh, no, I think, <laughs> Love um, it. uh, no, I, you know, I've always tried to, uh, you know, again, group of seven comics is the first time I even attempted to write fiction ever. Um, so we, I've it's always tried to, to be, I've always tried to, I've always tried to, um, uh, insert uh, motivations, um, opportunity to, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, Jason, you're saying X Men again and Claremont will put something in and maybe he'll connect it. Maybe he'll go back to it later. Maybe it won't. Oh, I oh, think oh finally he's gone. Okay. Oh my God. Oh my God. Back. Jason. It was the burrito. Um, <laughs> you know, just the uh, the ability, like you know, to give character opportunity for depth. And so, when new stories come out, or you know, new stories are percolating, and I want to work with those particular characters, there's something to be said for like connecting those those kind of little hidden, not hidden, but those little, you know, how, how those characters were positioned, how those elements were put in the stories, and then we can kind of extract and build on them, so they're not going, you know. So that to me is a like you know, where the character might go or how the character certainly might respond. Mm -hmm. um, that is like, to me, that, that comes out loud and clear. I think the thing that the challenge that we have, or at least the challenge I think I have, I mean, it's not even a challenge. It's just reality, but like, we want to keep like, once we opened up the playground that was like history for us to create in and muck around about, mm -hmm. um, you know, it opened like everything up. Right. <laughs> so like we started yeah. this, like, we started this, you know, seven days, five days in 1917 in Europe. But everything from that, like, okay, well, now this is in play. Now this could be in play. Now this is in play. And because of that, it gets very, um, it, it gets sometimes challenging because I, like, I know that I want to maintain some of these characters and build them. But I also want to bring in new characters and create <laughs> new characters and or, or shine a light at another part of of history or something that it, that is a great, it's a great fodder for storytelling, right? Like it's a great mm. ground to do that. And so that's one of the things that, that I think is both uh, a joy and, and a challenge because 
uh, and may, you know, I mean, it, it takes us in different directions. I think there is something to be said for, uh, there's something said certainly from a, a, a writing perspective where, and I have said this and I don't know how well it comes off, but I have definitely said this. I've felt it. I don't ever write. I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those writers who writes every day and says, you know, I'm 20 minutes at the craft, never done that. I've always really just when it, when that muse hits, when that inspiration hits, just, then the writing starts and I just like, I tap in and I don't fight it. And so I just like, so sometimes, nice. you know, there's, there's definitely, that's been my process. It's not that that can't change, but I have felt that like that has led to the best outcomes, but I'm not trying to, but I, I totally get the other approaches to writing that I'm aware of and like other, other comic writers for sure. Uh, this one just happens to have worked. Um, but I'm always constantly like, I mean, I say that and I don't, I'm like, I don't write every day. I'm constantly writing notes on my phone. So maybe that qualifies. You know what I mean? I like so an, an event, uh, uh, and a person, something, something. And then I'll, I'll text Jay and be like, well, when, what about this happens? And then this happens. And then Jason will build on that. And then suddenly, you know, we're, we're, we're on to another story. So what I feel like, Chris, is if ever I find a World War I trivia night, I have to bring you. Because uh, I feel like you will know so much just from constantly thinking about researching, looking at, hey, can we use this? Hey, can we? I, I feel like it would be I cheap. wouldn't bring him because everything you <laughs> ask, he would be like, yeah, but what if there was like a zombie monster that was there right. too? And they were fighting. <laughs> exactly. And then and then this other amazing hockey player came into the fight. And then exactly. this banjo player came. And it's just going to be like a mashup of all these ridiculous things that aren't helpful to your trivia night. So <laughs> it's like True. trivia plus imagination and ridiculousness. That's that's your wheelhouse there, Sammy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Banjo playing hockey player zombies in World War One. Oh God! There yeah. you go. That's like that's your wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, uh, so your question about the characters and I don't remember what was your question. It was, uh, so, it was like twenty minutes ago. It, it was uh, basically no. It's a good thing, Chris. Don't make that face. Yes. Um, basically, Jason, uh, my favorite writer is uh, has said right. that. Uh, when he's writing, he doesn't gotcha. write. It feels like they talk to him and tell him. I, I, I want to take now. your take as a comic artist when you're drawing. Yeah, like, do you feel like you have to consciously think about stuff, or are go? You have answers. Yeah, go. I have to consciously <laughs> think about it. Uh, you know, there's the part of comic book art where you're literally doing the drawing and just rendering, right? Like taking taking the lines and trying to finish them to a point of art for publication but there's also the part of drawing where you are um inhabiting the space of the character and acting on their behalf mm. putting them into poses so that they are communicating more than just what's in the script but you know the body language of how how slumped over are there whatever it might be and i am really excited to continue to learn how to do this better you know we were reading X-Men and Alpha Flight number one last night. And Paul Smith just takes us to school. He is so great at head nods, choosing A, the right angle, but just having the right match of like facial expressions with body posture and gesture and hands that communicate more than just what would have been on the written page. And um, so looking at the work of masters like that, totally inspiring and no none of that comes easy all of it is work and there's so much more that i have to do i try you know when i when i do read through the script that is there i do a little bit of acting out in, in my studio and i do a little bit of the talking with my hands extra so sometimes i'll have characters like they're saying something and they'll throw a hand toward the person they're speaking to because it i'm trying to add a little extra in there um but i do find it really challenging um having you know with group of seven most secret tale the first six issues of comics chris and i ever made um that was a lot harder working with these four original characters all inspired by the canadian women of history um but each of them is a wholly original character they allow a lot more room for me to draw them in uh, characteristic and yeah. like, I, I, there's more creative liberty um, from you know me to 
push their poses. And then also they each one fits into a different kind of archetype too. Like we do have this kid rookie on the team. And we have this character, uh, Dottie, who, who is this rook. And it, it, it allows us to, she can a little, you know, or a, a little more dramatic here or there. So her poses can get uh, more fun. And, you know, having a hot tempered character. So you can kind of lean into, you know, four quadrants a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, and then having like a, a tall, lanky leader. I mean, how many Batman cartoons have I watched in my life where you have like a stoic character, you know, who's got some size. So there, there are these different things that I get to pull from, but um, having the characters act and having their acting be communicated clearly on the page is a challenge. It's hard and I want to improve it all the time. And I try not to overthink it because I will get lost inside. You know. <laughs> I think it's it's very it's very true that it's a very true thing. I think you know Jason won't mind me saying this that like we with every comic we do. I mean the one shots are kind of fun and kind of like very much have a different energy to them for sure. And mm -hmm. and they actually and and that's also like really attractive to other people. That that we, that's what we found at shows people are drawn to the different different things. But like with every comic you know that we're trying to do, like we're trying to get better with every comic. Like every every one is meant to be the next best one like the the best that we can put out at that time you know uh and then the next one for that is going to be better i wonder if that's gonna be better like that's that's it's that's a goal that's that's something we we do aspire to do i think the proof is in the pudding there too i think yeah. you can see it other than <laughs> oh. um, other than one of the print jobs with that that I'm, i wasn't happy with the way the work was represented um I do think that the craft put into each issue is better than the previous. Yeah. And That's I'm very much looking forward to finishing um, Peregrine's Bad Lions, which will then make it that we have four Instagram one shots that are ready to go into a collected paperback. Yeah. And then finishing as well, there are 50 pages only to go before we are finished the peregrines paperback wow and then that will mean that we we have like three graphic novels ready to go you know each very distinct um three distinct products that we can have when we table at events sell from our online store uh, group of seven comics.ca that's the number seven um and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that and there being something unique about each one in terms of the development as well as like the the visual style of it so we do have this one uh peregrines this is an angoulême special so this was only available when we were in france at angoulême the international festival of comics and it is a combination of all f at the that moment in time five peregrines comics that had already gone to print so they were reformatted uh three of them re reformatted for black and white and the other two were just reduced in terms of size so we did have uh these like two volumes to bring with us to france so that we weren't selling a huge variety of things that we weren't we really didn't know what to expect going over there uh -huh. and we weren't sure like we didn't know anything about what display, if any, we were going to have, what kind of presence. We didn't know really about what the readership there would want, like what the market would bear. So okay. going over there was like the most informative and inspirational experience yeah. um, and bonding experience, truthfully. I mean, sharing a single cot with you, uh, and I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was it was an incredible experience in every way, um, and it really helps us like, plan for next steps strategically as a business and as creators. Like it informs where we want to invest our money in this project, and also where we want to take story creatively. Like everything it was uh, totally, uh, completely worthwhile and and beautiful experience going over there. So having having like a version of it, I can already see where it's going. Um, it, it helps and I see the progress, like right in that volume, you can see it go from first time we ever drew peregrines to, you know, where it's at now. And it's, it's super right cool. on. That is amazing. Now, uh, that being said, we are 
five seconds away from a, a full hour. Um, I did want to make sure we got in at, and let the people know um, where they can get all your books. Um, well, we did start about seven or eight minutes into the hour, by the way. That's true. I know, but I we oh, so we are there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're so, right. um, tell people where they can get all your books. What is available? What is not? Um, maybe leave that part out. But uh, group of seven comicsca That's where I'm at. Um, is that the best spot to get all the books? And is everything available? So yeah, like that's that's the spot to get everything that's available. Uh, but soon, uh, or, or you know, yeah, online or come see us in person. Those are the best at the shows. That's those are the best ways to get it. Uh, you sold know, Jason, out. Jason mentioned reprinting things because yeah, we're sold out. We sold out of of, oh, of the also course. We sold out of Londinium. Per, uh, Hunter's Moon, the one that was up, you know, and it's currently it was, it was nominated for the best comic sequential awards last year. I think there's like four four copies left, four or five, and it's done. Oh my god! So we we do these shorter print runs for these things, you know, hundred plus a bit, and then they go, and so then we repackage them. We'll repackage them as as the trade. But yes, they are still copies available if you're interested. To the 2023 best comic book nominated sequential Hunter's Moon that is available, and then Group of Seven Comics Most Secret Tale, the the expanded edition. It's got 20 pages of bonus content. That's the version that's available. The other version is gone. We also have some remaining back issues from issues one to six, the singles. Oh and so we sell that as a bundle. So you can, you, you, there's a few left. Oh, cool. Uh, there's a few left of those. And, and some people, and like we sell those too, like people like the original floppies. So we do that as well. Those are the things that are available online. There's some, there's some e versions too. That's, you're seeing some digital copies there too. People can download if they're interested. Um, and then at our shows, uh, there's a fewer things we have in the mix. Uh, there's, a, there's some group of seven theme prints that we make available. There's uh, we're part of a, a card set put out by Raid Studios yes. in the Toronto area that has features seven cards from Group of Seven Comics. Uh, makes sense there with some peregrines and some Group of Seven. So like those things, you can get to us. You know, come out to the shows and see us. Um, we're out and about. We're we're usually. During the season, which is usually, you know, let's say Feb to June, and then again September to December, like we're more often than not around. Hey, what's the next show you two are going to be at? I will be at Artsy Fartsy on April twenty first, which is a Sunday at Transac in Toronto downtown, so Bloor and Spadina area. And then Chris, you will be. I'm yeah, Halton Hills. Halton Hills Fan Fest, which is put on by the Halton Hills Public Library, and so that's going to be at their main branch in Georgetown, Ontario. Um, oh. And so we'll be there on the I'll be there on the 27th. Jay, you might we'll see if you can make it. Uh, awesome! So that's I always a blast it. too. We we love libraries and we love library shows. They've been very good to us, um, and so we're we're quite. That'll be that'll be a lot of fun. They've been asking us if I can come for a couple of years and it hasn't worked out. So. So that's then, that's the next yeah go ahead like first week of June where are we gonna be Chris oh Eastern that Ontario weekend? we're taking the comics to Eastern Ontario specifically Deep River Ontario which is oh, about cool. an, hour, an hour and a bit north of Ottawa up by Petawawa which is the big military base up there uh, so we have been added to the Deep River Geek Fest along nice. with a couple other creators uh, and uh, we're we're stoked it's gonna be a small town show. But apparently, you know, they do it in the local arena. It gets packed. Um, we're excited to be in another. This is the thing we talk about friends. Like, we're just excited to take our books to new places. Like, whether it happens it. to be, you know, France in the middle of the Bordeaux region or it's in <laughs> eastern Ontario, Deep River. Like, we're keen. We're keen to do it all. Right? So so that's that, that's what's currently on in the works. Uh, that, that Those things are all scheduled. And then we are on wait lists for things. We have to wait back for here from other things. Uh, but you will not. It will not be hard to find us. I love it. Uh, one one thing I, I wanted to say. Um, I think at the most recent con I, I ran into you at, um, you'd mentioned you'd fully sold out of your first print of the graphic novel Group of Seven. Uh, congratulations! Um, I think that's a huge Thanks. achievement. Um, Thank you. I'm excited you. to see the next two things that are coming out over the next however long. Um, and yeah, I, I just I think you two are fantastic. You're fun to get to talk to. 
um, but also you make really cool books. Um, I I guess one thing I was curious about is when you're making the books, like you guys have been together at this for seven years. Um, what has changed in your process together? Like Chris, when you write something, what are you now adding in that you used to not add in because you know that'll just streamline for Jason or Jason? What do you know that you can take a lot of creative liberty with that Jason Chris doesn't maybe fill in that you can just run? Um, go for it. It's been, it's been fairly fluid, I think, the whole time, and it's been incredibly collaborative. You know, the amount of texts that go back and forth for sure for the past you know seven plus years. I will say jokingly that every new story I do, I throw in something that Jason hasn't drawn yet. So it's like, so it's like, and now there's, and now there's a train chase. You're like, son of a, and now, and now there's this, and now there's that, um, you know, there's, there's a, anyways, uh, but no, I think, you know, I think we, we're, we're accustomed, we're much more accustomed to each other. I think as it's grown, like what we think will work, what we need to have a conversation on, which we need to like talk through, um, certain things. Um, you know, I, I, there's, there's things that, you know, Jason knows, like there's things that he'll draw that like, I'll like, will totally excite me. I'm like, wicked. And there's no, there's things I know that I'll, I'll share with Jay and he'll be like, oh my gosh. So like, we're very, we're very connected that way. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think probably there's definite, if, if, even if I can't like give an example of the top of my head, like I, you know, we do, we do create for this, like for the, hmm. the collaboration. Right. So I think that's always in the forefront and we're always talking story. Like we're always talking story. So um, it's just, an, it's just a, a, you know, a measure of, of getting through with it and like putting it down and, and going for it. Yeah. One thing I think that's changed is I've learned a lot from you, Chris, about diplomacy. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> um, when it comes to collaboration, you are excellent at, making suggestions without putting a person on the defensive you're really really good at it and i am not and so i often have to like type something and then be like okay what would sanigan say and then i go back and i could write it in, in your voice a little bit i take a cue from you because uh whenever you have another idea it doesn't it doesn't come off as that i've made a mistake it comes off as sort of like hey what if like hey your your word is and i'd say it with love and i'm not calling you out your word is perhaps mm -hmm. and that's like my my key word like perhaps there's another way to do this and i'm i i love that idea that that it isn't really about you versus me mm -hmm. uh it's about what idea is gonna win uh, not the wind's the wrong word. What idea is going to best serve? And uh, so learning that from you and then putting that back into the dynamic um, has made it so that the, that collaboration works smoother. Where I, I hope I'm ne not hurting your feelings when I throw perhaps at you, but I learned that one from you and I, I found it to oh, be a, a very good salve for when you you have a different idea. Um, because what you know, when anyone spends time writing a page or drawing a figure, um, you've put your yourself into it, and therefore you're in, one is invested in that thing. And to you, we don't have a boss. You know, we're we're two friends who are working on something, and so we need often that third set of eyes, and that often is you know maybe it's me then you then me, and I'm the third set of eyes, or maybe it's you then me then you. And you're the third set of eyes, but we need that third set of eyes always. So it's it really helps to have that an, a good, healthy uh, relationship. Uh, well, of I, feedback and and iterative suggestion. It's great. I, I'd say that this is now turning into the Chris Jason Lovin show. So get ready, people, because the thing that I really appreciate with you over the last seven you know seven years and us working together is, and I, and every time it happens, I'm thankful it happened is that you will you will you will push and challenge not in a in a uh, confrontational or dickish way <laughs> but you will you will throw up you know you you you're so creative that you will throw up ideas or like we should think about doing this or think about doing this and i'll be like i don't know that's just we're trying to do this and this or whatever right and i think in my head 
And then I'm like, okay, let's just go try it. And then I'm like, oh, I'm so glad you did that. Because now, like, I think the first one shot happened that way. Obstacle course. I think you're like, I think we can do this. And I'm like, yeah, but maybe we should just keep on doing this. And then like within two days, like, oh yeah, no, this is the thing. Well, this is like 100%. I'm so glad that you, you brought that forward because I know I need that push sometimes. Absolutely. Sure. To like, and I don't know if you're hearing drums behind me. I apologize about that, but. Uh, I'm into it. Perhaps we should start a band. Yes. You know, YouTube show, comics, bands, you know. Actually, oh. I, I really did want to talk about that, truthfully. Not starting a band, because I I just, you just stepped back from departed one. Departed a band, yeah. Um, which oh. is heartbreaking. No, it's all good. I'm just, uh, you know, as I said in the email to my buddies, like, I'm just worn out. And that's okay. Um, but I was thinking about um, how to infuse more of what we love into comics Mm. more because we Mm. already do put in in our way mute our love of pop culture music hockey a history canadiana you know all that it's in there in some form but i want to like turn the volume up to 11 love it do it all right and so that like i want to i'm interested in exploring how to make it look even more like our rock and roll side to us our indie rock southern ontario indie rock love like how do how does that show up even more in a comic that is not about that does that make sense it does i want to talk more about that yeah the other thing too there's that the other thing too that is clear from sorry if we're taking your time conrad um you know, oh I'm not, hey i love this you kidding okay me? Nope. The, other, the other thing that the other thing that came out of of our trip and our our experience in angoulême as part of this canadian trade mission that we were part of is we made a ton of contacts there uh kind of like official government contacts um and 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 moved conversations forward about the about the the notion of creation and storytelling and comics and how that can push other elements of public service forward like whether it's whether it's things like uh looking at like like we do cl- like we, as conrad you're aware like we, we go to classes sometimes and we talk to students yeah. about process and history and, and all like our books and like what if you took that model and just like put it on a level that like it's you know it's it's feeding into a larger cultural conversation about storytelling and the medium of comics and and how it could be like broadcast and amplified on a national scale and and the importance of creators and what they can contribute to storytelling to you know mythologizing whatever it happens to be like whatever the outcome is on a national level and so we had those kind of preliminary conversations in Angoulême with representatives from from different spaces, and huh. what it what it brought for for me and Jay and I had had these even like further conversations since there. But it's the contribution piece. Like, how do you how do you take some of this, which it clearly has has landed and impacted folks and and has found audiences, and how do you amplify it? Not necessarily from a sales perspective, like that's part of it. But how do you amplify it so that the art of comic making, which that's the big difference of what we noticed, by the way, in France, is the conversations about cartooning and comic making, it's about art. And not to say those conversations don't happen here, they do, but here a lot of it is fan driven. Uh, and not it, all to say that the conversations, like when we walked around this medieval city, People were like, your comics creators? Oh my goodness, tell me about how you do everything. As opposed cool. to as opposed to your comics creators? Oh, that's neat. Like, oh, that's cool. Comics are cool for kids. Like, yes. which is like, right? Anyway, but what I, was, what I was gonna say was though that like it was clear to us that there is an opportunity to move comics uh forward as a vehicle for for further storytelling for connection on a level much beyond the one that we're currently existing in. Hmm. And so that was, that was something that was like hopefully going to lead to further things. Like we came back from that show 
with like potentially the opportunity to like really move some of these conversations forward and explore what that could be from a community perspective, from a storytelling perspective. So anyway, that's, I know that's not, I know I said a lot there and didn't really say much. I get that. True. But that's the government, Perhaps. that's the government civil servant in me. So, <laughs> but it was all yeah. true and I, I get it. We're on yeah. the same page. I mean, I, I'm definitely extremely interested now in, in, in all the things because, um, like, and for me, that mentality comes back to just like both of you, I'm sure, growing up fans of specific cartoons, in my case, Batman the Animated Series, X Men, Batman Beyond, uh, you know, picking up books, Batman Hush, and then getting into all this stuff. Like, I've always revered art or revered comics as art, right? Like, it, it's a functional form of art to me because it delivers a story. But it's art. I don't care whether it's framed in some weird person's buying it for millions and millions of dollars at a museum, or if they're picking it up for five ninety nine or whatever. It's art, um, and so I appreciate that. And also, yeah, whatever you can do to push it further and to have it serve people better, not just as art, but yeah. whatever it can do to kick people into engaging their community being more thoughtful and, and creatively cooperative. I appreciate that. So I'm very interested in whatever that is going to be with you guys. Hmm. Well, well, if, if, and when something happens, we'll let you know. <laughs> Please do. Um, I'm sure, you know, we'll see you around and we'll share. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's just, again, there's, there's space there, space there to be filled by, you know, like I think, the talent on offer as part of that trade mission, um, you know, the people we got, we, we met from across the country and like what they were bringing to comics in general was incredible. And then, and then you, you, you match that up again, you know, on top of like every, all these, everything, every other part of the world bringing comics and cartooning to this space. And, and you're just, you know, it, it's, it, it, it reinforces so many it reinforced so many things of why we love the medium and why you get into it, I think. Um, and yeah, like it, it's, it's not hard to see a future in which, um, you know, some of these creative spaces end up influencing the next generation of creators. Like, I, I think what I'm getting at is one thing that we talked about on the trip, Jay and I, just because we were we joke around, is that like when I think of those like Canadian Heritage Minutes that came out in the early nineties, yes. like the first the first run of them. I mean, it's I mean, you know they went away and they came back because there was like a pop culture people desire for them. But like I was clearly, I can absolutely say I was clearly the target audience for as a 12, 11 year old who already was interested in history and kind of need on it, and like those minute bursts of like mm. vis audio visual creativity silliness sometimes some serious some silly some in between that hit me like a ton of bricks over the last year i, I realized that was probably the genesis of like me trying wow. to tr seeing seeing history as a as not only a thing that i'm i deeply interested and care about in but like a path forward to 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 do something with it creatively which I didn't, I, I never even thought about until probably about a year ago. And it's, wow, it's okay. it, it, and so it's one of those things where I think there was a bit of a realization and in the conversations that we were having with, you know, officials here and there about like that thing worked. I think it, it worked. So then like, as a, as a public program, as a public program. Yeah, right. 100%. So like what's, so then maybe there's an opportunity to do another thing like that, that hits the next generation. Right on. Oh, Oh, I, what, mm, okay, yeah, mm. I love that idea, because, I mean, I think every single kid in, well, and from my age anyway, like, I definitely remember the Heritage Minutes, um, the one that sticks out to me is uh, the one where they talk about, uh, I think, I believe it was Jerry Siegel, and how he's explaining to his partner at the time how he's creating, or the character of Superman, and like, it's Joe Schuster, gets, yeah, yeah, thank you, Joe Schuster, and he gets on a train, and he's like, you know, he's come up with the idea, um, It'll never fly, Joe, or whatever yeah. she says. <laughs> Take it, Lois. Maybe yeah. we'll something someday. Dun, da, 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 yeah, da, really. Um, <laughs> hokey, but worse. Super but it hokey. works. 
And, and I mean, did you I, ever I, see? I, sorry, did you ever see the one about Winnie the Pooh? Oh yeah. I don't so remember have, it, but I'm sure. Which I is have. a World War One reference. It's too. a World War One reference. Essentially, what's happening is uh, Christopher Robin and his father, who who wrote Winnie the Pooh, yeah, they're at the yeah. right. They're at the. Uh, I'm guessing it was like a zoo the, in the London. The London Zoo. Yeah, London Zoo. Yeah. And Very cool. the, the bear Winnipeg, you know, who was a, <laughs> a mascot God. for a, a Canadian battalion or whatever, whatever, whatever the specifics are, I'm not going to remember. But there's that scene where little Christopher Robin is like seeing this bear and the artist comes and like and is talking to his dad about how they're going to write these stories with this little boy, Christopher Robin, and they're going to use this bear, Winnie, as the as the uh, as the protagonist so that's a really great one okay but have you ever seen the this hour has 22 minutes spoof on it i don't think i have oh god oh about winnie winnie the feces bear it is <laughs> it is so funny if you if you grew up watching these canadian heritage minutes like the next step of sort of making fun of them because they do matter to us uh it is you know taking the piss out of it is really it's so much fun. <laughs> yeah. um, you should check that one out. So one of the one of the reasons it's such a unique moment in time is is you can't make a Canadian Heritage Minute now that reaches that audience because we aren't right. sitting there watching commercials the yeah. same way that we were in 1992. You know, they had a captive audience, and so we all watched them. We all, you know, most people were bored by them. Uh, pretty quickly you are irregular chris and that's one of the great things about you is you're not like everybody else you know i watched them all keen to absorb whatever i could and then i was bored with them you know because they the the way they were filmed or the the accents it all felt like this little pocket of canada that didn't seem like where i was living which is fine um but the idea of it that there is a way institutionally that we can that one can be making or a team or whatever can be making uh canadian narratives that reach an audience and make an impact uh i love that idea obviously i'm i'm all in to explore discuss make fun of have fun with play with all of that stuff yeah fascinating so are, are we gonna end up now getting like peregrine pauses where I'll be scrolling through my stream and all of a sudden it'll be like a, a brief couple of panels of like educational, but like entertaining Peregrine's comic. Hmm. Little Peregrine pause here or there. I don't know. I don't know. I'm... <laughs> Perhaps. Well, whatever comes next, I'm looking forward to it. Um, that being said, guys, we are at 8.30. We're 20 minutes past the full hour. Um, so I will ask you my one last question for tonight, uh, and then I will let you go be free, uh, be with your families, draw, and do all the things that make you happy. Um, what is it currently that you guys are reading? Oh. Do when you're not globe trotting, making books, you know, going <laughs> on, selling everything. I have a prop. Oh, God. Should I go first? Yes. Do it. Uh, <sighs> I'm currently reading. Lone Wolf and Cub Gallery Edition, mm -hmm. which is a high res color scan of original art from the Lone Wolf and Cub series, presented as you know it was originally created. Um, that's like the, the page as it was made. And I'm reading it as a master class in comic book making. Shouts to Wayside Comics and Cocktails. Omar, you are a, a saint. Let's put it that way. Um, so that is what I'm currently reading. It is a fascinating uh, lesson in storytelling and craft. What about you, Chris? Oh, so much, so much. Uh, but you know what? I'm going to say one one book that stood out for me. Um, and, it, you know, it... it, it Again, target audience, I don't know, but um, Ian Herring has a, a webtoon series out called The Odyssey of Benedict, Benedict Arnold, which he captures in um, in a graphic uh, book form. I bought volume one at Toronto Comic Con. 
uh, he's again, he's playing in similar pools. He's playing with history. He's playing with fantasy. He's playing with um, there's the theme that I'm clearly seeing, at least from the, the volume one. I think he's finishing volume three up right now. You know, this, these ideas of people who may. Oh, there it is. The Odyssey of Benedict Arnold, volume one. Um, I love first of all, I love his art style. I love uh, Ian's art style. Um, talk about minimalist, um, but also just very angled and beautiful. Mm -hmm. um but i would say that you know the idea of of treason and the idea of of being a traitor and what does that mean um it, it explores those ideas mm -hmm. uh, those those archetypes those tropes uh that was and that was a super fun pickup at toronto comic-con so that's that's the thing that uh, at the moment i think uh can plug for sure i dig it well absolutely gentlemen after three years i i think i should have you back on a little sooner next time but Thank you so much for coming to hang out with me, talk about comics, uh, talk about Group of Seven, and uh, your crazy adventures over the last three years. There's no, been we some. didn't tell you nothing, man. We didn't tell you nothing. <laughs> We're taking most of that stuff to the grave. And by grave, I mean a different interview at a different time. Or we'll take. Oh, <laughs> no, break no, my you, heart. With you. Then... <laughs> different interview with you. Oh, we'll, fair. we'll tell you everything, man. We'll sp we'll spill the tea or cognac, as it were. That's right. Oh. Just tell me all about that con. Uh, well, gentlemen, thank you. And uh, yeah, for the folks out there, like, comment, subscribe, go to group7comics.com, buy everything before it's gone because it will go soon. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Golden age to present, digest to oversize, never miss new comic day. Yeah, no surprise. So where's my no prize? Check the letter columns, can't find issues.